Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this edition of The Future Human, where we will be in conversation with Alex Gomez Marin, the director of the Pari Center, and Mauro Bellino. Mauro is an Italian biblical scholar, translator, popularizer, and best selling author for Mondadori, one of the major publishing houses here in Italy. During his career, he has directed and supervised the translation and publication of 17 books of the Old Testament for Edizioni San Paolo, Italy's main Catholic publisher. Mauro's books take the reader by hand and accompany them through a fascinating narration of biblical verse, which are analyzed in their original form in ancient Hebrew. And he will be in conversation with Alex, who is a Spanish physicist turned neuroscientist. Since 2016, he has been the head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory in Alicante, where he is an associate professor for the Spanish Research Council. And he is, of course, also director here at the Pari Center. So today, Alex and Mauro will be in conversation around the literal translation of the Bible and the oldest secret in history. There will be about an hour dialogue between Alex and Mauro, and then we will open it up to the audience for questions and comments. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you, Eleanor, as always. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And special thanks to Mauro for accepting this live conversation in English. So to just jump directly to the topic, two months ago, a friend of mine unexpectedly gifted me this book, a topic I would not particularly seek for, and I, and I read it in two days, and I had really, and this is not just metaphor, an ontological shock, an ontological shock. Ontological um, shock. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because if Mauro, what you're translating as literally as you can without interpretation, as you said, respecting, I like that, respecting the Bible, if that is true, let's say accurate or more accurate that, than other translations slash in, interpretations, then many things are upside down, many. And let's start perhaps with the most important one, which is the word Elohim which is usually translated as, as God. But if Elohim is not God, then the Bible is another thing. So let's start with that. Right, please. right, right. It's, it's a big summary <laughs> of my ideas. Sure. So there are many words in, in this book, Hebrew words, right? Elohim, Yahweh, Olam, Kavod, Ruach, and so on. And many, many topics like the Garden of Eden, the burning bush, sacrifices to the gods, the chosen people. But let's begin and let's see how far we can go with, with the problem with this word, Elohim, whether it means God or gods or something else. And what you discovered translating when you were asked to translate as literally as you could without putting any, if possible, any interpretation. What you discovered when you were translating the, the sacred texts. Oh, yes. First of all, I want to apologize with your audience for my English, which is very, very, very basic. So I hope to be able to, to make me understood by, by your, uh, your audience. But uh, uh, first of all, I, uh, let, let me start with an argument. I want to say that my method, my approach to the Bible is to pretend that the Bible literally tells us what in the Bible is written without introduce, um, introduce uh, allegories, metaphor, and so on. And I noticed that uh, if uh, we read the Bible literally without allegories and so on, um, the, the Bible has a lot of sense. If we read the Bible with the theological lenses, the Bible, the entire Bible does not make sense. And this is why I prefer to read 
literally the Bible and to pretend that the Bible is uh, really what is uh, written in it. Do you understand? Yes. Is it clear? Yes, it's, it's important to know my method, my approach uh, uh, in order to understand what I I, I say I say in this conversation. In effect, the term Elohim is the most important because Elohim is a plural term in Hebrew language, but it is always translated as God, singular. But this is clearly a mean, a mean translation is clearly a mistake, is a, mist is a theological mistake, because the theologians need to say that in the Bible there is God. But it's important to say that the Bible doesn't speak about God. I want to be clear. I don't speak about God. I don't want to say that God does not exist. God is not my concern. I only read the Bible and tell to the public what the Bible really says. This is important to, to know. I'm not an atheist. I'm not a dogmatic. I want to have an open mind and uh, I recommend to read the Bible with an open mind. And also, if uh, the Bible does not speak about God, it, uh, that doesn't mean that God does not exist. I want always to clear this fact because it's important. We talk about a book, not about a religion. The religion is a construction on this book. This book was not uh, written in order to create a religion, but only to narrate the uh, relationship between uh, the, the hero of the book, i.e. Yahweh, and his uh, tribes, the tribes of Jacobs, not all the Hebrews. That is important to know, but only about, about the tribes of Jacobs. The other Hebrews were enemies, were considered enemies, always. This is important. Now, if you have, if you have a question, <laughs> yes, many, but I want to let you unfold it slowly. Let me just mention towards the end. I want to ask you about the nevertheless big consequences of your translation of the Bible, regardless of whether you're saying something or not about religion. But if if you unmount this book, the three, at least three main religions crumble, <laughs> right? And that's something to bear in mind. And, and it's fair to say that's not your intent, but that's a consequence of your work. Yes, that's not, that wasn't not, my, wasn't my intent. Yes. But I, is, a con uh, is a consequence of, uh, of uh, uh, a method to approach it to the to the Bible. Uh, it has consequences for the religions, but not about the fate of the singular person, mm. individual. Mm. Because yeah. if God exists, God exists and exists, and the fate can refer to it, refers to it. Yeah. I want to see that 
that God, the God of the religions, is not into the Bible. So but you say I know the consequences, the consequences yeah. of course. Yes. In a sense, after uh, translating uh, uh, 17 books for San Paolo Edizioni, when I started to, uh, to speak in public, to narrate in public my findings, they immediately show me the way to <laughs> the way out. They immediately fired me. And yes. so since uh, um, 12, 10, tw um, 2010, I continued by myself to translate and to write to write and publish books. I published uh, uh, 16 essays on these topics because uh, these topics is very, very interesting for, for many cause, causes, of course. One of these is the problem that these this, um, translations create to the religions. Yes. And to get this out of the way, something very interesting and starting, it is starting to be a common pattern amongst my, my the people I talk to here. When you go and check Mauro's Wikipedia, <laughs> which is something you shouldn't do, you rather buy the book and read what the author has to say, we find the usual words, conspiracy theory and pseudoscientific speculation, right? Which yeah. to me means very little and even less coming from Wikipedia, but of course, what you're doing is unpopular, I suppose, on many sites. And I don't want to dwell a lot on, on, on it. I just want to make it explicit and then continue with, with this translation of the word Elohim. And you, so you said it's clearly a mistake. So would, um, so theologians perhaps disagree because they, they do their interpretation. But, but what about translators? What about philologists? Do they agree? Is it clear? Is it un unequivocal that the proper translation or that, or maybe we, you should explain that first. The point here is that it's found in plural. We haven't spoken about the singular versus plural. And then let us know if, if there's controversy, not amongst theologians, but amongst other translators. Oh, yes, I read that. But uh, I, I want to say um, a thing. My books are studied in the uh, um, theologians university. I know I know that for sure, uh, because uh, it's necessary to know that no one in the world knows exactly what Elohim means. No one in the world, no scholar. Elohim in, uh, is translated in many ways because no one knows the real meaning of the term Elohim. So in my books and in my videos, in my channel, Mauro Bellino official channel, I always recommend not to translate this word. It's better to leave it as it, as, uh, it is. It's better to leave it in Hebrew. But what is fundamental is read carefully the context in which this term is put, be, is used, because uh, is the context that the context uh, um, allows us to understand what uh, the Bible says and what uh, the Elohim means. And the context, the context tells us clearly that Elohim were many individuals in flesh and blood. So is absolutely clear. The Bible tells us also the name of several of these Elohim 
and the hero of <laughs> the protagonist of the Bible, Yahweh, was just one of the Elohim, one of multiple Elohim, just like, like the other. And Yahweh neither needed to fight against the other in order to conquest, uh, to conquer lands to rule over. Now, how come other translators didn't come across that? Or perhaps they did. It's just that you're putting it today on another context through another lens. Maybe you're offering a more complete picture because as I said at the beginning, having read your book, it's not just about Elohim, it's about many other things. But how come they didn't pick up this fact? Because you said it was clearly a mistake. And I ask you how clear that is. But also the word mistake is interesting. Is it simply a mistake? Is it deliberate? It it surprises me that, you know, that that well, that I didn't know that, and that new translations of the Bible are not done with this more literal translation. Why, why didn't well, this why didn't I know about this until this friend give, gave me the book? But uh, uh, I think it derives from the fact that the religion and the theologians um, uses the Greek Bible and the Latin Bible in which Elohim is translated in Greek as Theos, in Latin as Deus. Uh, I, I, had, I, had, I have a classical background so in my I study, I studied ancient Greek and Latin. And this fact was verified by the Catholic, Catholic publishing house before to give me the task to translate. Because without knowing, knowing Greek and Latin, it's too hard or impossible to translate correctly the Bible. So uh, in my translation, I uh, point out these three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And this is fundamental in order to understand this fact. Yes, but, but I know that if uh, Elohim is a is a plural term for the theologians, is very difficult, is very hard to explain to the people the 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 meaning of the of the religion, and so they necessarily have to say to try to demonstrate that Elohim is singular. But in this book, in one of the chapters devoted to the Elohim, I demonstrate that in the Bible, there are at least 23 Elohim. 23 Elohim. And so it's clear in the Bible. They are named. They are fighting each other. They are they were ruling over diverse uh, various nations. And Yahweh had one of these nations. Yahweh had the, the, the people of Jacobs, uh, which was uh, assigned to him by the chief of the Elohim that in the Bible is named Elion. Yes, and I understand better now that the whole discussion is not doesn't hinge only on singular versus plural, because I've tried to I've tried to find the the counter arguments to your translation, and some people say, well, you can use the the the, the plural, but it means singular. I mean that, or you can, as you already mentioned, well. You read it allegorically. I've also asked my my 
some of my friends who, who can read Hebrew, how do you read the Bible if you do? And they say, well, um, we don't pay so much attention to the words. It's more about the vibration. And I, th I respect all of that. I think this is all fine. But what you're saying here is not only that it appears as plural many times, so it's not God, but gods, but that these gods are very peculiar creatures that do all sorts of things that don't look like godlike stuff. And as you go on through the book, and maybe you can pick which ones you want to emphasize, otherwise I can do it. It's It feels really unbelievable. That's why I mentioned this ontological shock, you know, like like the, the chosen people are not the chosen people, are those ruled by a particular Elohim, Yahweh, and, and the gods like sacrifices of stuff that's burned for some very weird reasons. And here there's a bit of speculation. Adam is not made, it's engineered, engineered. The Garden of Eden, I mean, I'm I'm giving all the I'm doing all these spoilers, Mauro. I hope you don't mind of your book. But the, the, the Garden of Eden was a lap. It's like, come on, what is going on here? Right? What is going on? But perhaps is going on the truth. The truth that uh, I think the uh, hierarchy of the church knows very well. Absolutely. Because in the, in the history of the translator, I'm not the, the only translator that understand that understood this topic. Because uh, you re you read my my book, I introduced many proofs of the fact that Elohim is plural. And uh, uh, in effect, Elohim is used with the verb at the singular and, and in the plural form. And in this book, I also uh, demonstrate that if Elohim is a singular, the Bible doesn't make sense. Absolutely. The Bible has sense if we consider that Elohim were many individuals. And in effect, the, the topic of Elohim is the most important. In the book, I deal with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, many other topics uh, as uh, uh, Satan, angels, uh, Ruach, uh, Elijah, uh, the cherubs, the, the, the so-called cherubim in Hebrew, uh, and, and so on. But the most important is Elohim, because, uh, as you said uh, uh, before, if Elohim means God, the Bible is a thing. Is If Elohim doesn't mean God, the Bible is entirely another thing is uh, an historical an historical bible that narrates as a small part of a bigger history which is narrated all around the world the bible is only one of the books that humanity wrote at in the books of uh, Asia, of America, we find the same concepts. Mm -hmm. We find the same concepts also in the Greek books, in the Latin books, in the Latin so-called mythology, and so on. In uh, two of my books uh, written for uh, um, Mondadori, I compared the Bible with the, the, the Homeros books and Homeric books. And it's clear that they narrate the same history. They speak as about the same individuals that in, in Hebrew uh, are Elohim, in Sumerian and Assyrian, are Anunna or Anunnaki. In Greek is Theoi, 
but they are the same individuals. Now have who, the oh, same the, the same need. Who, the so same characteristic. Who who are they? They're not gods, but they're not humans. And so here we are again. Here's again <laughs> the theoretical physicist turned neuroscientist asking a Hebrew translator about what extraterrestrials, other species. And I know this is now speculation. That's not literally reading from the Bible, but you, you triangulate from many, many aspects of the lives of these Elohims as to what they were. So what, what do you think they were? It's a, a very interesting argument, but the Bible doesn't tell us where they came from. Reading carefully the Bible, we can understand that uh, they were not humans. Mm -hmm. They make the humankind. Mm -hmm. They made the humankind. And they intervene uh, with a surgery intervention. And this is said also by many rabbis who say that the Bible knows since uh, uh, 4,000 years ago, the Bible knows the clonation. It's enough to read the method with which uh, were formed, not created, Adam and Eve. And that, I repeat, is, uh, is uh, written by many rabbis who knows the truth. You know how, if that enrages, if that, if that upsets, more than upsets, theologians, you can imagine how much this should upset scientists, especially biologists, right? If now you're suggesting or even saying that the human race is not created by God, they'll be happy about that. <laughs> but it, you're saying it's not it's not just a product of evolution, natural evolution, but it's engineered by some sort of creatures more advanced than us. That's why immediately the 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 the, the hammer of conspiracy theory falls upon us. So what else can we say from this from the text and also from other lines of evidence about such a big claim? Here we have another big headline, right? Right. I think uh, there were or there have been um, another kind of intervention between the evolution and the creation. An intelligent intervention on the uh, Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, in order to produce another species able to understand and execute orders. Hmm. And so it's clear in many books all around the world. All these books, I think to the Hindu books, tells us more clearly than the Bible. And in India, this is not a problem. It's not a problem, the, the, the multiply, the, the number of the Elohim, which in uh, that land are called Deva, absolutely is not a problem because they don't have a monotheistic religion. On the contrary, we have a monotheistic religion which can't accept this fact. But in the Bible is absolutely clear. I have no doubt. Obviously, I pretend, as I said, that the Bible tells or told us the truth. I'm not sure of that, of course. 
because it's an ancient book. And with the ancient book, it's uh, necessary to be very careful mm -hmm. when you read it. But given the fact the theologians tells us that this book is the book of God, I suggest to read this book carefully with open mind, just like we read other books, just like we can read Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, Veda, and so on, with the same open mind. And we can uh, understand that they tell us the same history, the same history. Now, when you say truth, I guess you don't mean revelation. You mean that what was written is what they were trying to mean, right? That's what you right, mean by truth. Right, yes. right, right. Because some right. people may think you're saying that the Bible is the truth, but you're saying the truth in the sense that what these people bother to write so painfully, yes, I suppose, yes. it's what they were seeing or what they were being told by their people, right? Not the truth, the truth in absolute, but yes. the truth in this book. Yes. Now, more things here. When you were mentioning other traditions and you're mentioning polytheism, probably, and, and that's, again, I express my ignorance in all these matters. The, when, when, when in India, for instance, I suppose, they, they don't have a problem with the devas or all these many gods, Perhaps they don't, but do they have a problem in taking them, not seriously, but literally? Do they take them literally as you're doing of these Elohims? But I think that it's not possible to talk about polytheism because these individuals were not considered as gods but individuals uh, dangerous individuals uh, uh, to to uh, to those uh, it was necessary those was necessary uh, worship yeah. because of their knowledge because of their technology and so on yeah. but they weren't spiritual god mm -hmm. the bible but not only in the Bible. I would say in the all of the Semitic thought, there aren't concepts, there aren't transcendental concepts like spirituality, omnipotence, omniscience, and so on. And also in the Bible, for example, there is a term, El Shaddai, is a term used by one of the of this Elohim, and he used this term to present to introduce himself to Abraham, and said, "I am El Shaddai." This term Shaddai is always always translated as omnipotence. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean omnipotent yeah. El Shaddai the same scholars write that means uh, God the, 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 the Lord of the mountain or at least the Lord of the desert there is no omnipotence in the Bible Never. And actually, I had heard this from the theologians in the US, specifically, I think it was David Griffin who passed away last year, that the almighty, the word almighty was a big mistake. He was also trying from his point of view, which is a very different one than yours from process philosophy to correct and to try to think of a theology that can work without omnipotence and omniscience within a process philosophical point of view so so it's fascinating to see this also coming from from another totally different approach i would say but it's interesting to to read in the bible 
that when Yahweh want to conquer a land, he needs to fight. So it's clear yeah. he is not omnipotent, but is it as the same powerful of the others Elohim. Mm -hmm. And this, um, for example, is clearly is, uh, written in the Bible of the judges, where is written that Yahweh is as Kamosh, the so-called God of the Moabites, and is is uh, written that it has the same power, but. Uh, uh, is not necessary to have a particular translation. Is is the normal translation by theologians either this part of the Bible? Yes, because it's too hard to explain. But it's clear; it's under our eyes in the Bible that we have at home. Yes, not in my translations. Yes. Not in my translation. Yes. I was thinking of your translations, or at least the bit that you that you articulate in your books for us who don't know to be able to follow with the with the Hebrew text and then underneath the translation, your commentary, over and over, covering so many aspects. I was thinking of it as a scientific hypothesis. And I don't know if it can be falsified or how one would falsify it, but in the sense of, well, here we have all these pieces of data, this evidence, and here's a, an overarching explanation that tries to best explain what's going on. And there, again, not knowing a word of Hebrew, except the ones I've learned from you, um, these main ones, I would agree that if, again, if the, the garden was not, the garden. You speak also about, about the tree, the trees. That's very interesting. Everything is so interesting. These two trees, there seems to be only one. The burning bush, maybe there's another way of translating what that thing was. How these Elohims behaved. They they seem to behave as greedy, as angry. So that doesn't feel very spiritual at all. Well, all of these disconnected, they are not disconnected facts, but all these parts of the history of the story put together under the overarching hypothesis. Well, at least it should be entertained. And that's also a premise of all these conversations I have with people. It's that, well, what happens if we entertain this? Where does it bring us and, and how likely it is that it is the case? If, if, uh, if I understood your question, I want to say that if uh, put together uh, all the, the topics uh, about... Uh, uh, all the topics uh, you said, you quoted, uh, the Bible is clear. It's not necessary to introduce any other concept. Yes. For example, the bash burning, the term in Hebrew, sene, means mountain. A, a crest I don't know how to say in English. Yeah, to top of mountain. Yes, please help us. Yes, that's correct. Crest, top of a mountain. Thank you. Top of Sebastian. the mountain. And so Moses didn't see a bush burning, but the rocks on which perhaps there was some substance that, that was burning without burn the rocks. Like, uh, just like uh, if we put uh, uh, gasoline on the rock, we uh, see the gasoline burning, but the rock doesn't burn. I see. And does make sense. And in the other part of the Bible, the term Sene is the name of a mountain. It's called Sene. So it's not necessary to, to make 
particular translation, it's necessary read the entire context because often the meaning comes out reading various books. For example, if you mix the book of Genesis with some chapters of the book of Ezekiel, you clear understand the meaning of the term Ruach, which I, I, I devoted a chapter to the Ruach in this book. Yes. Because, because Ruach is always translated as a spirit of God. But in many situations, it doesn't mean spirit. It is a real, concrete, concrete thing because uh, it's necessary to say that the Hebrew is a polysemic language. And so it's only the context that allows us to understand which is the real meaning in that verse. Because in some verses, Ruach, can be the spirit can be the spirit of God, but in other verses, clearly it can't be the spirit of God. It must be necessary another thing. Because Elijah get on this ruach. Ezekiel get on this ruach. This ruach rises from the ground. The ruach, the, this ruach comes from the north. So it's impossible that in that cases, ruachs, ruach means spirit of God. Be because if uh, that were true, we uh, could, we must have the spirit that is to the no in the north, but it isn't in the south, in the east, or in the west, and so it's and that is ridiculous, of course. Now, when I was arriving at this chapter, I think it was towards the end of the book about ruach, and that must must happen now. Should be happening now to many of the audience listening, and maybe those who will listen later. It's like, oh no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Mauro is talking about, no, really, please, please. Are you talking about a UFO, a UAP? Oh, my God, here we go. Even more controversial. And given what's going on in the US right now with the hearings and so on, I given the bad press of, well, of ufology and so on. Well, Mauro, you seem to be indicating that was an, an, an antifa, unidentified um, area of phenomena. No, <laughs> I would say a thing. In the Bible, those are not unidentified aerial phenomena because are clearly identified <laughs> aerial <laughs> phenomena. There is no doubt. The hours they of today are unidentified aerial phenomena or UAP. But those in the Bible are clearly identified, are described. It's enough to, to read the, the book of Ezekiel, but it's necessary to read it with open mind. As I said before, without the theologians' uh, um, lenses. And it's clear that Ruach is a flying machine, but, but clearly identified, clearly described. In the, today, we see the lights in the sky. And so we unidentified these lights. Ezekiel saw this Ruach very, very close. 
he get he got on this ruach. Elijah got on this ruach. So it's absolutely clear. In Ezekiel, I, I, I recommend to, 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 if you don't want to read all the book of Ezekiel, I recommend to, to read chapter one, chapter three, chapter eight, chapter 10, chapter 11, and is written, then when the Kabod or the Ruach of Yahweh, when arises from the ground, produces a loud noise. And Ezekiel, in that case, don't see, cannot see the Kavod because it's, it's behind him, but he hear clearly the loud noise producing, produced by the Kavod of Yahweh when rising from the ground. So it's clear, and are they are not my translations? Yes. My translations are others. And, you see, and uh, uh, and I in the book I always uh, I always indicate the verses in Hebrew and the literal translation, so everyone can verify what I am saying. Everyone can verify. As a, as, a, as a joke, but that's serious. I don't know what people would like to believe now that there's this three, third ingredient in the menu because those who hated the idea of God the creator may be really scared about, well, if the alternative is these flying things, well, I rather now, I prefer, I prefer the old story told. But leaving that aside and related to this question of the Ruach, where are the Elohims today? If they were here, whatever they were, where are they no, today? I don't know. I don't know because my concern is the Bible. I don't want to make strange or hypotheses because I, I because all all hypotheses are possible. I am open to all hypotheses. But I don't tell the truth. I don't know where are they. There is a um, church a pastor in the USA which scribes that the Elohim are here and are the real the real governors of the earth. But I don't know. So I prefer to not answer, or better, I answer, I don't know. It's yes. not a problem. That's I fair. don't know because in the Bible it's not written. Okay, let me ask it differently then. And that's very fair, Mauro. If those people saw them, interacted with them, you even describe that they may have had relationships with, with women and so on. Well, if that was this usual exchange, communication, why don't we see them now? Where are they? I mean, not, not where are they, but what? No, that's that, that. I just asked you that. Not where are they? Where, why don't we see them as these people, these ancient humans used to? Because perhaps, perhaps they were or they are just like humankind. So that is written. In one letter of Saint Paul, in which is written that if you encounter an a noun individual and uh, uh, he asks you something, perhaps to come to your home, it's better to to receive him because he could be one of them is clearly written in Greek. So is in Indian taste. Because in Genesis 6 is written that they mixed 
with the daughter of the Adamites. So if they could to mix with daughter of the Adamites, it could mean that they were or they are very similar to us. And so, and if is the if is uh, truth, it's impossible to recognize them. Mm -hmm. Let me move to another one, because so far we've we've been talking only about the Old Testament. I know it's a big, we we could we could talk an hour about what I'm going to ask you now. But what about Jesus? What about the oh. New Testament? Who was Jesus? And well, it's not a problem to offer possibilities because we've been told a, a, a fiction, we've been told a regular man, and we've been told a man who also was a god, and we've been told even that he was a mushroom. I've I've I've, I've also come across that hypothesis, a serious one, a serious one actually. So who was Jesus in your expert from your point of view this is a, a topic very sensitive very very sensitive and it's uh, to uh, it's uh, hard to 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 try to explain in a few in a few words i know i know and by the way we could say I, I we could say maro let me just say if if somebody doesn't want to hear it they can just <laughs> they can just leave now no problem it's sensitive we, we want to hear what you have to say to the degree yeah. that this is complex but and I, I understand yeah i i can i can uh, i can tell two, two two words about this topic the gospels are the prosecution persecution of uh, the old testament and uh, in the gospels the authors took about Gabriel. Gabriel is not an angel. Gabriel is not a uh, spiritual entity. According to a Jesuit, this is cardinal in France, in France, um, Gabriel was an, in Hebrew, an ish, i.e. a man. In book of Daniel is clearly written that Gabriel was an ish. And uh, uh, Gabriel encounter Maria and Maria becomes pregnant. So Jesus could be, I prefer, I want the could be, because I haven't the truth, could be the son of one of them. The one who was prophetized before by Isaiah and so on. And it, he could be a product of this inter interbreeding between one of the Elohim, because Gabriel in Hebrew means power of an L. L as is a singular term of, of Elohim. So Gabriel is a power of an L. It's not a name of a person. It's a function. It's a, it's a function present in the Old Testament and it is also present in the New Testament. So we, we must know that. And if Jesus is a son of Gabriel and Mary, Jesus could be one of them. Now, and this allows me to ask you something that to me is very important that I don't understand of the whole story so far laid out. And maybe Jesus can help. All these Elohims, that they sound like more advanced than us in the sense that they can do things that, that these humans couldn't and they have this ruach and they do these things with us supposedly but they all seem very kind of petty psychologically you know like angry and greedy 
they they never sound at least from what i've read from you they never sound like elevate and i don't want to say they're spiritual but they don't sound like elevated beings but jesus sounds like that so are there elohims or descendants of elohims and we are in the speculation mode totally now who feel like sound like 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 spiritual beings like more evolved beings yes this is why before i said that this is uh, an hard argument because it, it needs many time to explain hmm. because uh, uh, Jesus is clearly different from Yahweh Yahweh that is uh, presented us introduced us as father of you, uh, Jesus as a God father is another kind of individual is uh, as as said uh, as uh, written in Bible is uh, uh, called Ish Milchama, i.e., man of war. So they didn't concern with religion, with spiritually, with the transcendence, with omnipotence with omniscience and so on. On the contrary, Jesus tells us a new message. A message, a message which is completely different from the message, from the tales narrated in the Old Testament. But without the Old Testament, Jesus could not be exist. Let's see. Okay, we're running out of time. I'll talk to you for so long. Let me just go for two more easy questions, Mauro. <laughs> so one is practical. Remind us the percentage of the corpus you have translated. How much more is left? Will you do it? Can you do it? Who can do it? Because when my friend give me this book my friend is called Alex like I uh, like, like me I said well is there a big linear bible is there a bible complete translation and I know the bible are many books and in some um, some cases some books are included others are not but what's the bar the percentage of what you have translated or, or others that do it like you and what else is needed maybe philanthropy money or are these books available my big question is can we expect to have a complete new literal translation of okay. the old and why not on the new testament i uh, translated for me only for me uh, almost 25 the uh, new testament new fives 25 times the, the the entire old testament and uh, new testament new testament in regard to old testament i translated 21 books and if you consider that the old testament of the hebrews contains uh, less than 30 books the percentage is very high you know but I have in mind to translate the entire Bible and to publicate, to publish my translation. I, 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 I'm not mad, mad fool. And it's it's a, 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 a thing that fascinated me. Yes, all right. And there's no problem in accessing those texts. I mean, that maybe goes back to the question where we started, because ironically, you were asked, maybe that's not accurate enough, not by the Vatican, but I, as I understand, by the publishing house of the Vatican to translate those books specifically to do it literally. And then they they didn't like that translation. Maybe that's inaccurate too. Now, do you need their intervention? What's your relationship with the Vatican, if any, about that? Uh, I, I was uh, very appreci appreciated as translator. In effect, they published 17 books 
translated by me with my name, 17. These books are in the faculty in this University of Theologians, are studied. Of course, uh, these books uh, are dangerous for them, but they want, want, want uh, to know what I said, what I wrote. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember the, 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 the question. Well, your relationship with the Vatican, do you need their text? Oh, okay, okay, um, okay. Do, are you in good shape with them? Some people inside, I mean, maybe that's secret, but they write to you and they say, well, good work. We already knew that, but this is not what we want people to hear, etc. Today, I don't have a public relation with, with the Vatican because I was fired. And so I'm continuing to, to, to work by myself. Mm. But I know I am in relationships when some individuals, some I individuals of the Vatican, that uh, they uh, want to be public, but they have personal contact with me. I see. Well, and I'm so glad of that yeah. because uh, uh, this fact increased my determination. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay, my last common question. So here in the future human, we explore the, the future human. <laughs> but to do that, we need to see where, where we are, our place. And very importantly, also, that's why we've also been but reflecting it's, with other... It's uh, the future... Often, uh, someone uh, says that uh, the man want to do as the as God. You froze there, because Mauro. Because the man want want to, no. and if the Elohim came from other worlds, we are we are um, like them. We want we want to explore uh, to explore other other worlds. Hmm. All right. So you jumped already into the, what I was going to ask you because I and was saying also we. We want to create it or fabricate it other species. Yes. Just and like they make yeah. with us. Well, look, um, all that may sound too crazy, but if you think what we do with cats and dogs, oh, you don't hear domestication. We've domesticated many species. And now with AI, many people talk about hybridizing with the machines. Yes. So, well, well, these things are can have their moral derivatives, but we entertain them. Well, why not entertain them in a wider context of what we discussed today, but, as as to the future human? Yes, but what is interesting is that human species has many characteristics of domesticated species. Many characteristics. And the question is, who had domesticated, domesticated us? Mm -hmm. Because no one species domesticates in the, uh, herself. It's necessary, there is another. But mm -hmm. many, many, many biologists say, it, say that. Say that we are characteristic, uh, typical of a domestic species. Thank you, Mauro. I'm, oh, it's I'm... possible that the, in the Bible uh, is bas basically um, present a possible, a possible truth about our origins. Origins. Yes, and that's precisely why I wanted to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much for sharing you are frozen. this. I'm frozen and you are frozen too. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing this with us and for yeah. doing it in English. I did understand because you were frozen. Yes, I'm saying thank you for sharing this with us, for doing it in English. And now I'll open it up to the rest of the, 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 the audience for their comments and questions uh, for about 25 more minutes, if you don't mind. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, hope, I hope the audience understood what I said. I think it was very clear and we will hear from them now. I think you were very clear. Thank you. Thank you. If you, you would like kind. to ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen under reactions. I see we already have quite a few hands up already. And so I will invite Paljin to come in, please come on with your question. I would just ask you if you could speak slowly just to make sure that Mauro understands mm. your question. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Yes, your English is very, very good, and you were very clear. Um, I just wanted to make one comment because I, I've done seven years of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew many, many years ago, and I remember my struggle with Hebrew was that we don't know what the vowels are. So I can say to you, him, hum, and hem three different ways. And so that was all my struggle when I had to produce a paper. I think it is subject to many, many different interpretations. And then you have the whole faith tradition of 2000 years. So looking at it as I did 40 years ago, I realized there are tremendous difficulties in translating the Old Testament but a lot less in the New Testament. And we have a wrathful God, we have a judgmental God, we have a God that's angry. And then, you know, you can come up with what like Ian the Gilchrist thinks that goodness, beauty, and truth are important. And so I think that um, I understand your work. I think it's quite a, a, labor, a laborious thing that you're trying to achieve because we don't know what all the vowels are in Hebrew. So we can come up with different interpretations. But I like to look at the faith tradition and the sense of people. And that has led to terrible things as well. So I think we just always have to continually evaluate. But thank you. Leave this for some other comment. Thank you to you. Uh, yeah. In effect, yeah. it's, it's uh, right, uh, the ancient mm -hmm. Hebrew was written without vowels. Yeah. The vowels were put by the Masoretes between the fifth and the ninth century before Christ. But uh, not uh, to to be um, accused. Come si dice? No, no, essere accusato. Yes. Era giusto. To 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 choose my my uh, my Bible. I translated the Masoretic Bible that you know is the official Bible of the tradition. The, the Masoretic Bible is, is considered the official. I know there are many Bibles in the story. There are the Masoretic Bible, the uh, Sumerian Bible, uh, uh, the Greek Bible, the Syrian Bible, Bible and so on. But uh, um, given that the, 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 um, the theologians tells us that the true Bible is the majoritic, mm -hmm. I, I use that. Well, that not, depends not my on choice. if my you choice. accept that that's the only true Bible. But, but I uh, only read the text of uh, Qumran I read the Old Testament in Greek and so on, mm -hmm. of course. But when I speak in public, I prefer to speak about the so-called official Bible. Thank you. Thank you, Valjean, for coming in. Jeremy, would you like to, to join the conversation? Yeah, thanks. Um... Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think that one of the questions what I'd like to hear more about, and I don't know, again, it's time and I'm sure it's complex, is, is the sense of the spirit or, you know, in, 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 in David Bohm's work, Science and the Spirit, for example, there's these, these subtleties and, and uh, I suppose in the narrative, as I understand it, which is limited, uh, you know, in reading Bohm and in reading McGillcrest, 
um, my spirit led uh, and was aligned very much to the way that I understood um, the teachings of Jesus. Uh, certainly not maybe conventional religious teaching, uh, I'm sure. I mean, I, I don't regard myself as a conventional religious person, but, you know, the Holy Spirit is in a sense what Jesus says that he leaves. And I think in the narrative, those people that, you know, you have this thing, the mystery of the resurrection in a way where, you know, he comes back. And so I, I think none of what you're saying really rocks my world, to be honest. Uh, as a person who follows in the way of Jesus, I don't see that anything you're saying really rocks my world because um, I, I walk in the spirit of, of Jesus, of that risenness. And if he was, you could call him an alien who came down, or if he was sort of married off with um, maybe someone from a higher order that we don't know about, I think that his message of love and peace and nonviolence as in the Sermon on the Mount and those things, are what we follow in the world. And certainly I think there's been corruption and contention and a kind of war that's gone on around with many theologians. So I just wanted to say I appreciate that. And my question is, so what would you say the Holy Spirit is? And isn't that what Jesus really gave? And how does that relate to love and joy and peace and patience, etc.? Thank you. There are many studies of the Jesuits in which is written that the Holy Spirit is a Christian transposition of the Gabriel of the Old Testament. And one of these uh, uh, Jesuits is a cardinal in France is a is a theological scholar and he uh, writes clearly that the holy spirit is uh, the translation the 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 see yes the translation of the gabriel of the ancient testament but this is a question of faith and i prefer to not enter in this question because the because the bible <laughs> It's an historical book, and I want to 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 say to to narrate to my public what uh, it really writes. Okay, so thanks very much, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you, Niels. Would you like to come in? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Much of what you talked about this got very deep meanings in me from a long life of experience of the spiritual. Uh, I have one question about ancient Hebrew. I've got a friend who was an ancient Hebrew scholar and he mentioned that the, the word Yahweh is consists of two letters which des each describe a different direction. Is that is that true? I, I understood from you that Java is just one of the Elohims. So it's like a, 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 a an offspring of the same family, so to speak. That's how I would like to see that. So uh, it's it's a very important for me because I have I have developed some software and that is like a process, and that process is like a, a mind, if I can just say that. And that mind comes about by combining two directions, in the sense that the mind is is from the future to the to the present, and the other direction is the direction that we live. And and this was an incredible experience for me to to just try this out. It came like an intuition, and then I tried it out, and it had a huge impact. So that uh, I'll just say that I have I have always felt felt this spirit in my life, and the way it manifests itself is like perfection. 
and I've had experiences of producing perfect things in in my life at various stages without without any input from myself, so to speak. Uh, that's all I want to say. But uh, I, I I found I like the word that the Elohim is. Uh, I also uh, you you mentioned uh, Al Al Shaddai in in the in our understanding from the our Bible. He's uh, he's the god of uh, of uh, prospect and and uh, and and a, a helping hand. And uh, so, in a sense, to me, that that is uh, that is actually the what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit as the helper who would come, and he will only come because I had to leave you. So by his resurrection, the Holy Spirit was then imparted to all mankind. That, that's how I see it. So that, I will stop now. <laughs> okay. I would like you to, to say something about that. <clears throat> I, I heard uh, with open mind what, what, uh, what you said. Yes. But I prefer to remain strictly, strictly united with the uh, literal uh, um, meaning of the Bible. Yes. Uh, without uh, any theological interpretation. Yeah. And, and I, I appreciate your experience that okay. I'm sure is, is, uh, is very important for you. And I, and I don't, don't want to question it, absolutely. Okay. Yes, but, but how did the Bible come about? It was oral kind of <laughs> tradition that that carried that through from from experiences. So uh, experience, without yes. experience, there would be no <laughs> there would be no theology. It's uh, it's uh, it's pos all is possible, of course. Yeah. But uh, no one in the world uh, knows when the Bible um, was right. Yes. Was written. No one uh, knows when it was written. No one knows when it was read, because it was written without vowels. So yes. it's extremely difficult to reach the real meaning of the Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> and and it's uh, the difficult to come to understand the real message of the Bible. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's important. It's important for you your experience. I'm absolutely sure. But perhaps but you could say something about Yahweh, since Niels asked, and we didn't talk about uh, that can, word. Can I just say Yahweh is yeah. is a name uh, which was pronounced when the lang Hebrew language did not exist. Yeah. Yes. Many centuries before. So no one knows the real meaning of this term. No. The scholars have uh, uh, made many hypotheses about this term, but I prefer to let him untranslate it because uh, each translated translation is a product of one scholar or two or three or four. Yeah, yes. And it's not uh, sure. Absolutely, no. because no, uh, because uh, us, uh, because we don't know in what uh, language he was pronouncing the first the first yes. time, yes. Yes. and he was uh, written, and it was written several century about it was pronounced, and the vowels. And the vowels uh, were put many, many, many centuries before after it was written. So about uh, Yahweh, we don't sub, sub basically we don't know. No. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. I, I'll just say that I've been reading the Bible for many years, for sixty years, and, and okay. I take 
I take it literally, and and I've made out my my own interpretation of things, and no. and there are many contradictions, and 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 you have to overcome those. So, no, but I, not... I found that it's it liter the literal thing speaks to me in my experience. It's it it grows. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you very much. Glenn, come in. Hi, I uh, unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yeah. And yes. All right. I have two questions. Uh, one pertains to um, Jesus's miracles, and the second pertains to Emmanuel Velikovsky. So the first question I wanted to ask is um, the so the, the these miracles that we know from Jesus, you know, like splitting the water and the fish and the, I don't know, turning something into wine and stuff like that. Do you think he had like high tech gadgets that he used to do that, or do you think it was? Did, do you do you think it came from a, a maybe like a uh, like a telepathic or telemorphic or something like that? You know, from from the mind. Did he do it from the mind, or did he have have like in Star Wars like a laser beam or something like that with with what he could do it? And um, and the second question to Emmanuel Vilikovsky. I was wondering, have you um, studied him, or did you, um, in, like, in, in your studies, did you, um, um, did you research him? Uh, because I, I you know that, I think that kind of ties into because he he was a close friend, as I understand, of Albert Einstein, uh, which then would tie into David Bohm and to David Peat. Um, so yeah, those are my two questions. Yes, I start uh, with the second. <laughs> in brief. Uh, let me say that if uh, Velikovsky is in truth, all the history falls down. All the history falls down. So we don't know. Uh, uh, Velikovsky, Velikovsky is uh, very ap appreciated and is uh, um, also uh, very contrastated. <laughs> I I I, did, I I don't have studied it the all uh, uh, is theory, so I don't know I don't know answer completely to your to your question. And the first question, the miracles of Jesus, in one of the of my Italian books, I examined some of these uh, miracles, and they didn't uh, were miracles. Uh, because uh, um, Jesus uh, uh, speaks uh, to his uh, to his apostles, to his uh, servants, and uh, scusa Seb, puoi aiutarmi un attimo? Sì, dimmi tutto quello che vuoi dire. E Gesù gli dice: Ma è possibile che a voi debba spiegare proprio tutto? So Jesus at one point says to the apostles. Is it possible that I have to explain everything to you? Dunque c'era qualcosa che lui sapeva e che faceva e che altri non sapevano e non facevano. So there is a there's a chance that actually he was trying to say to them that there's some things he cannot really explain and uh, it, and can and couldn't really show them at their stage of development, I guess. And also with the gospels we need to pretend they are truth because we don't know who wrote who wrote these gospels <clears throat> because they because um, not 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 uh, mark uh, mark luke matthew and uh, uh, john wrote these gospels uh, these uh, gospels uh, we have only uh, transcriptions belonging to a time after the life of, of Jesus. We have more than 20,000 of inscriptions and uh, <clears throat> there aren't uh, two equals. So we must pretend it's difficult to uh, to have a, a, a for sure a truth by the gospels okay thank you very much thank you to you i'm sorry for english 
Uh, Gina. Oh, no. I saw Gina disappeared, but maybe that was a mistake. No, no here I am. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for this uh, important lecture. I don't know if you're going to have time, but I wanted to ask if you've studied any of the Gnostic texts in the Nag Hammati, um, and if you have any uh, correlation with some of those Gospels, um, particularly related to the Elohim or the origin stories. The gospel, the Gospels, uh, like uh, the one of Thomas and uh, other like that, uh, have not an uh, uh, um, connection with Old Testament because as a, pro a product uh, of another uh, way of reasoning. Are not uh, Jews' testament, are not in the history of the Jews of the history uh, reasoning. If I don't I know if, you're saying, if, if I understood if I, your, your, your yeah, just, just so, to make sure I understood, you're saying that they're totally different and that they're they're not the same, but some of the stories overlap. No, yes, there there were at that time fifty four at least fifty form of Christianity. They fought one each other. Mm. And each of these form of Christianity told that they had the true verbs, the true phrases of Jesus. But we, but we don't know uh, when, uh, way, uh, what they are. Well, thank you. Thank you. Eva, would you like to come in and ask your question? In in Italian, I I, <laughs> I I could explain better, more better than that, but it's impossible. I understand a little, but I don't know if I could that. <laughs> Eva, you're muted. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very fascinating and very multidimensional conversation. Um, I come from a very different background as a Jungian scholar and a Kabbalist, so it's a different background, but I was, I won't, and I'm certainly not a Hebrew scholar, and I very much appreciate the uh, incredible scholarship that has gone into this. I had a question that I posted over here. If you remember way back, and it might have been the 60s when this book, Chariots of the Gods, came out by Eric Von, because he speaks of the, uh, uh, children are uh, the uh, children of the gods what and i think it overlaps to what you're speaking about um intermarrying with the children i think the women uh, children of the humans and that there were two different people that he it was fascinating i remember finding out about it in the 70s and the other one is elizabeth Heitch's book initiation where she has a, a, a her memory of uh, ancient Egypt, of an initiation, she also speaks of what you're talking about, that there was an intermarriage between the sons of gods and the daughters of men. Um, are you familiar with these uh, particular? This episode is narrated in the chapter six of, the Gen of Genesis, when the author tells us that the songs of Elohim took, took the daughters of the Adamites because they were Tovot. And Tovot in Hebrew means beautiful, of course, but it means also uh, useful, useful for interbreeding. <laughs> And they did it. Yeah. So one and, uh, and uh, from uh, from uh, these unions uh, became the giants. So oh. is uh, that is written in the sixth uh, chapter of the of Genesis, 
but is uh, written also in the Ethiopic Book of Enoch. That is not accepted by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but is accepted by African Church. And and did the and is it would you agree that the sons of gods when they intermarried with the daughters of men that they pollute that they uh, the consciousness was lowered? Does that make sense to you? But the reading carefully the Bible, I don't find an higher conscience in these Elohims. Oh. No higher conscience. They were, they were men of war. Mm -hmm. They're making wars. Make it wars. Yeah. <clears throat> and well, uh, they, they didn't concern with the religion, with the spirituality, with the events, with the sky. E di lì anche che sei molto amico di Eric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, my, my study fix, fix uh, with uh, the study of Eric von Deniken mm -hmm. and Graham Hancock too. I've okay. been at, at home of Graham Hancock. Yes. Uh, we talked about for, for more than two hours. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, because yes. the so Bible talks about an higher civilization before ours. That was before the warlike one, the warlike Elohim, before? The war? Because you said the Elohim were warlike. Yeah. Well, men of war. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, but, yeah. But not only, but not only the Elohim of the Bible, also the Elohim of the other nations like Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Hindu culture, and so on. The Greeks, the Romans, they were always the same. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That would explain a lot of where we are, isn't it? For example, yes. in the Bible, there is a term nefesh. Nefesh means neck, breath. Only neck and breath. And the theologians translate as translated it as soul. But it doesn't mean soul. It does it means neck. So so person. So person breathing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Alex, I will hand it back to you now. All right. Well, gratitude to Mauro, to you for your time, your scholarship, your great effort, your generosity, and also to Elisabetta and Sebastian, who are behind the scenes, who also make this possible. Yes, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Well, this is a not only fascinating and interesting, this is a, a very important and very urgent topic, I think, that with respect to the topic, but also with respect to what we did today. It's very important that we give us permission to talk, to talk about these things, about anything, and I think only if we, if we can talk about things, we can think those things and then we can feel them and then we can know them and then we can talk again. So thank you. Thank Paris Center. Thank all of you who are here for just entertaining these thoughts. Uh, it's, it's an obvious thing to say, but it's, it's in danger of extinction, the ability to talk. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too. To you, thank you to all. Thank you for having me with you. Bravo. Bravo, Ma Mauro. Hey. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you so much, Alex. This was wonderful. Thanks, thank you, Sebastian. Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Alex. And thank you, everybody that joined us today.
and we look forward to seeing you at our next online event. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.